we've got over 100 participants uh, with us uh, at this event now. And I think what's really important um, for this important um, uh, topic to move this forward um, is that we have a big community to mobilize change because there is strength in numbers. So I'm hoping that this session is the start of much more collaboration um, on the important role that copyright has uh, in open access and to make sure that it becomes more of an en enabler with your help. Um, and we all know that much more needs to be done by European, national and local policymakers to ensure that legislative and non-legislative measures that support research and education serve the needs of today's university management, its libraries, researchers, teachers and students, particularly related to facilitate open access and the reuse of publicly funded research results. But we are seeing good signs of change and commitment to reforming copyright in this area. So first of all, through funders like the Arcadia Fund, who is financing the KR21 programme, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later. So warm thanks go out to funders like Arcadia, who really help us move the goalpost here. Coalition S, of course, has done a lot to mobilise funders to call for rights retention and CC BY already, uh, uh, I think, several years now. We also have a number of member states who are committing to progressing an EU copyright and data legislative and regulatory framework um, fit for research through the European Research Area Action 2. So that's really important, the leadership that the EC um, has organized, there will be commitment going forward for several years to work, uh, to progress that forward. And actually only the day before yesterday, CISAR, so an organization which uh, contains leading universities in science and technology in Europe, published its position on ensuring high quality, transparent, open, trustworthy, and equitable scholarly publishing, and making its first recommendation of five, enshrining a secondary publishing right at the European level to empower researchers. So there is, uh, this is a very dynamic uh, area, but there's not that much known about what's going on across Europe. And that's what you will hear. Um, you will hear some of the first findings today. We're really looking forward to sharing some of that with you. Um, so we will concentrate on two legal mechanisms that support open access today, secondary publishing rights, and rights retention and open licensing. And they are both viable options on a path to more equitable access to publicly funded research and its reuse. What's important is that university leadership, librarians like us, funders and publishers are provided with an evidence base of where we stand today to make new informed decisions in favor of OA. And the two projects today, Project Zero, uh, looking at uh, secondary publishing rights and Project Retain, looking at rights retention and open licensing, uh, they are going to deliver on that uh, and um, provide that evidence base um, with experiences, good practices and references that will inform our policymakers when we encourage them um, uh, and where we campaign for change in this area to support open access. So where do we stand in these two areas? Where might we want to go? And what's necessary before we proceed on a sustainable pathway to open? So before I hand over to the first speaker, I'd just like to take you through uh, today's agenda and also briefly remind you about the KR21 program. So today's agenda, you've heard the introduction, uh, and I will tell you a little bit more about KR21 in a second. And then we have um, two uh, presentations of about 25 minutes. We've got Project Zero uh, starts us off on secondary publishing rights, and then we've got Project Retain on rights retention and open licensing. Um, we then have a panel discussion. Um, I will pose, pose some questions, but I'm I'd really like to invite you also to put your questions in the chat and we will also ask those to the panel. Um, and we will also open it up to a couple more experts who will join us um, 
from both of those projects to join in the fund. And then we will briefly uh, tell you what the next steps are for these projects, because these are, of, of course, just the initial fund uh, findings. The reports aren't out yet. So this is really hot off the press. So uh, the presenters today, we have Kiriaki Zutsu, who's a PhD candidate from the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens from Project Zero. So she will um, highlight those findings from that project. And then we have John, John Treadway, who's the director of Great Northwood Consulting, who's working for Spark Europe on Project Retain. So they are the two people that you really need to focus on today. But we have additional panelists with us as well. Um, Janis Tsakonis, who's the, the director at the Library of the University of Patras, and who's also vice president of LIBA, I think many of you know, and Ignacy Labastida Hirwan, who's the rector's delegate for open science at the University of Barcelona. And he's also the chair of the Spark Europe board, and he will also can speak to Project Retain uh, if needed. So uh, very briefly on um, KR21, to those of you who are not familiar, what's really important for KR21 is that we um, focus on bringing about change in copyright policy and practice across Europe to strengthen the right of knowledge to all. And it's built on a conviction that knowledge is essential for education, innovation and cultural participation and of course research and that everyone should have the possibility to access and use it in particular um, through libraries, archives and digitally. So the program goals of KR21, we really want to address the currently really incomplete and fragmented approach um, to supporting research, education and culture in Europe. Um, a lot of the policies I think I already mentioned are really behind the time. So how do we um, innovate um, and develop policy that really matches with the needs of today's researchers, educators and students? It's important that we sustainably mobilize the experiences and voices of our libraries, but also those other uh, knowledge advocates and support them in their work because a lot of the time they have really be, uh, been the leaders uh, of change for open science and also supporting in innovating uh, copyright. And uh, what's important um, at the end of the day is for us to deliver practical policy and political change in several areas, um, in eBooks, contract override, open norms, secondary publishing rights, and rights retention. And those last two are the ones that we're talking about today. So um, the program, it's a Stichting IFLA Foundation program supported by the Arcadia Foundation. Again, thank you very much uh, for the funding to make this happen. It's in partnership with Liber and Spark Europe. So it's a small, a uh, neat team um, with many behind the scenes. And we're also developing an international network of uh, copyright experts um, to really drive this forward. The key mission is to facilitate fair access to eBooks for users. Let me just hide that, sorry. So for users of public national educational research libraries protecting users' rights under copyright legislation from contract override and technological protection measures that undermine statutory exceptions to copyright, promoting the case for the introduction of open and flexible copyright norms in Europe to aid research, teaching and learning, and the, the focus of today, advocating for a legislated scholarly publication secondary publishing right in laws, and accelerating the uptake of author rights retention activities and open licensing in Europe. So in short, what we want is fair access to eBooks. We want to protect exceptions against contract or technology bypasses. We really want to support research and education by better providing access to research publications and by protecting authors' rights. So I hope that that gave you a very quick overview of what Knowledge Rights 21 is about. I think the photograph 
doesn't need any explanation. I did take this a week ago. I live in the Netherlands. But it's about us being aligned. We're not all in the same row, but let's, uh, we're all going in this in the same direction. We're all behind open access today. And how can we find a copyright framework that works for us going forward? So if you have any questions, if you'd like to tweet, these are the addresses that you need. And without further ado, I'd like to invite now our first presenter, Kiriaki Zutsu um, from the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens to tell us about her initial findings of Project Zero. I'm going to stop my stop sharing here and it's over to you. Uh, hello from me. Yes, uh, would you like to share your screen? Yes, just a second. So everyone uh, can see my screen, my presentation. Yes. Um, first of all, uh, I would also like to welcome you to this uh, webinar. Uh, I have the honor and the pleasure to share the preliminary findings of the project uh, Zero task uh, that conducted by LIBER in the frame of KR21. Uh, secondary publishing right, uh, SPR in short, uh, is regarded as a key instrument that uh, should be considered at the national and international level. It uh, removes the contractual barriers uh, between uh, publishers and authors from, uh, uh, for the deposition of uh, post prints and version of records in uh, public uh, open access uh, repositories. Um, our initiative attempts to give uh, answers to three objectives. The primary need was uh, to form a global picture of SPR by taking into account all the actors involved. Uh, for this reason, we have studied countries which uh, have already formed a legislative framework, others which uh, have open access policies, and uh, last but not least, we got the opinion of uh, international stakeholders. Secondly, we try to go deeper and uh, analyze successful cases of countries uh, that already have uh, SPR legislation in order to discuss, uh, discover the path that uh, followed towards that direction. And at the same time, uh, it will be possible to understand the impact of SPR. Uh, of course, as you may imagine, uh, there are possible obstacles to such uh, processes. And this is the third objective uh, of our study. Uh, the formulation of uh, legislation may not be an uh, undistributed and uh, steady path uh, to its uh, completion, but uh, by understanding the impact of SPR legislation and figuring out possible obstacles, it will be easy, easier for countries without legislation to make a step uh, further. Um, it will become more obvious later in the presentation that uh, SPR is uh, a complex issue involving the different stakeholders with different perspectives and combine, combines aspects from uh, both copyright and uh, open access. Um, but now let's see some uh, the current situation and the actions related to open access. Uh, there are a number of countries that uh, have set the aim of 100% uh, open access. But uh, is this possible? Uh, we have seen that the target uh, has not been firmly set and uh, several uh, extensions of the deadline uh, are expected. Uh, there are also growing concerns about the cost of uh, gold open access. Uh, the European Union has uh, already made uh, its moves with uh, the grant agreement uh, model terms about open access and the European research area proposing uh, a European Union copyright and uh, a data legislative uh, framework. Um, European, uh, European Union um, 
acknowledge the inability to use contact for academic and educational purposes and uh, raises uh, ethical questions for publicly funded uh, research. Uh, furthermore, the open access agenda um, has been embraced by various organizations such as LIBER with uh, the zero embargo model uh, law, uh, ALEA, Cesar, Leroux, uh, all the above, uh, of course, are affecting the environment of open access. Uh, in this slide, I quote uh, some phrases from uh, recent uh, Council conclusions in order to underline uh, the timeliness of uh, the SPR issue in the Council's uh, agenda. Actually, they are pointing out the need that the authors of research publications or their institutions should uh, retain sufficient intellectual property rights to ensure open access. And uh, moreover, uh, are raising the issue of open access to scholarly publications involving public funds. Uh, so, I return to the approach followed by our initiative. Our uh, methodology consists of two stages. The first stage uh, includes uh, a wide uh, desk research in order to specify republishing rights in national legislation in European countries. And the second phase actually consists of surveying, surveying um, open science expert, uh, government and uh, agents, legal representatives, and uh, international stakeholders. Uh, here in the map, uh, we can see the selected countries. The countries uh, in yellow, Germany, Italy, Austria, Netherlands, Spain, Belgium, and France, are the seven countries with legislation. The five countries in blue, uh, do not have uh, any legislation and are Switzerland, United Kingdom, uh, Denmark, Sweden, and uh, Poland. Uh, but let me here explain why we selected the specific countries, the blue ones, which don't, uh, don't have uh, legislation. Of course, there are numerous others they, that uh, they also don't have uh, legislation, uh, but uh, Exploiting data from the CIVAL database, we chose, uh, we chose the countries uh, with the larger scientific uh, production. Uh, so uh, that we have a representative percentage of 75% of the publications in the Council of Europe in total, including the, uh, the countries uh, with legislation. Uh, we conducted uh, interviews from uh, representatives of all the selected countries, governmental agents and uh, open science experts. Uh, the participants indicated the date and the time of the interview according to their own convenient availability uh, between the 1st of February and 6th of March. All the interviews were conducted via Zoom and lasted uh, about one hour. Um, for each participant, we had prepared a personalized uh, interview form with questions according to each person's uh, expertise. As uh, it was uh, necessary, all interviews were recorded, of course, with the consent of the participants. Uh, for the purpose of analyzing and extracting uh, information. Um, um, now it's, here, uh, it's time to present some uh, basic concepts in more detail. Uh, the root of, um, in this schema, we're going to see that the root of uh, the scholarly production starts from, the, from uh, concepts and ideas that uh, is manifested as preprint after uh, researchers work. After the peer uh, reviewing process, we have the author accepted manuscript. And this is the second manifestation. And the third one consists of the version of, uh, uh, of record. Uh, rights retention 
refers to stages from preprints to final versions. Uh, policies have been formulated to regulate the openness of the products of uh, scholarly communication with the aim of rights retention. Institutions, organizations, and funders are responsible for the implementation. From uh, the other side, secondary publishing, which uh, as a legislation is the responsibility of a nation, uh, regards, the, regards the second phase after the official publication. After some months, uh, six for science and 12 for humanities, um, the author has the right to upload the accepted manuscript to a green uh, open access repository. Uh, this period is, should be minimized. Uh, the author accepted manuscript should be published uh, instantly uh, without embargoes. Uh, rights retention and secondary publishing rights are the main uh, instruments for ensuring the openness of uh, the scholarly outputs. Uh, the implementation of both uh, instruments is mainly the, the responsibility of uh, institutions and uh, libraries. Uh, in this slide, uh, we can see the components of uh, an SPR article. On the right uh, section of the slide, uh, we can see the abbreviation of the components. For example, uh, the extent, extent of funding is the abbreviation EF on the table. Uh, but uh, I don't really want to bother you with uh, these abbreviations. Uh, as you can see, the German and the Austrian OSPRs are the most detailed. Uh, the table also, also indicates some uh, difference in the embargo period. Uh, for example, some countries have uh, an embargo of 12 uh, months and uh, some others 6 to 12 months. Uh, another important note is uh, that the licensing is missing. Copyright was uh, either fully assigned or licensed on an exclusive basis to the publishers and uh, the institutions, mainly the university libraries, uh, cannot really attach any terms to the publications in the repositories. Uh, one more uh, optional feature is uh, that uh, uh, the one that uh, governs the beneficiaries. For instance, SPR should apply for any author in a work and not uh, just for uh, the corresponding one. Um, but why did these uh, countries need uh, open access legislation in the first place? Why did uh, these countries create uh, such a framework? Uh, the respondents uh, mentioned that uh, the main reasons were the protection and the strengthening of the authors. Uh, while uh, copyright law is considered as the tool for the protection of the publisher, the SPR is uh, the countermeasure for the authors in order to regain their power. As you can see from uh, the quotes, uh, the SPR augments the transparency of the research. Uh, one participant mentioned that uh, makers of creative work should be more protected and have more rights. While uh, another one added that um, the public uh, funded research could be available for every citizen. Uh, SPRs actually allow the public to access some scientific publications while uh, gold open access is not considered um, sustainable. Um, but under which context uh, the SPR exists in each country? Each country deals with the law from a different perspective. In some, cut, in, uh, some countries, uh, the law is part of the copyright law, while uh, others consider the SPR as part of the science law. Uh, some others 
uh, such as uh, Belgium, relate SPR with uh, the economic dimensions of uh, society, since they provide uh, a basis for um, the economic exploitation of scientific production. Uh, for other countries, uh, the main motivation is their alignment with uh, European policies. Uh, the formulation of the laws was based on, um, on the cooperation of various partners. Uh, we didn't notice any specific partnership schema, but uh, it is evident the role of the libraries in these partnerships. Uh, as it is easily understood, the number and the types of the partners make us infer that the, the skills of the team and uh, of the team members uh, are also various. Uh, the dimension in uh, which the issue is included, for example, science or economy, is uh, the factor that shapes the form of uh, cooperation. For example, the inclusion uh, of uh, secondary publicity right under the umbrella of the economy will uh, also require the participation of a partner with uh, a corresponding uh, background. Um, the process of completing the legislation uh, was not always uh, without problems and uh, after a unanimous agreement. Uh, SPR is uh, part of a broader law, so um, for example, such as uh, copyright laws, as I already mentioned. Uh, so it stands very often low in the agenda and uh, there might be no high degree of uh, engagement. Uh, some cases of resistance were observed during the public uh, consultation uh, process, such as in Italy and Spain, uh, while uh, the key stakeholders were uh, poorly coordinated. Uh, on uh, the other hand, the legislation process was uh, facilitated by supportive uh, politicians or policy makers, uh, such as in the Netherlands with uh, the Taverna Amendment. Uh, the participants also pointed out that uh, the lack of uh, engagement by um, research performing uh, organizations, uh, institutions and uh, universities. Uh, it is also important to note here that um, there have been cases where the subject of the legislation required the cooperation of different ministries, fact that caused uh, communication problems. Um, in some other cases, the lack of uh, monitoring mechanism was uh, an, uh, another apparent obstacle. And of course, uh, publishers raised uh, the flag of uh, resistance. There is a case uh, where an, uh, an international publisher tried to hijack uh, uh, the process. Now, regarding uh, implementation, uh, the Netherlands uh, seems to be a successful case, case uh, having implemented the program uh, You Share, We Care and uh, partial, uh, partial implementation has been meant in uh, Belgium, France, Germany and Austria. Uh, but uh, let's see some uh, implementation issues that um, participants uh, highlighted. Most of the participants mentioned that uh, their countries tend uh, to attach the SPR to a research assessment and promote it through um, funding calls. In some cases, uh, where the administration structure of the state is complicated, for example, uh, the federational system, uh, there is a different implementation approach. Uh, in some other cases, 
uh, there are legislations which uh, are not firm. The, um, there are always uh, open options for escapes. Uh, there are cases like uh, the Netherlands, uh, which uh, have uh, unclear law, uh, but uh, key stakeholders, universities and libraries, uh, decided upon what is feasible and uh, took uh, action. Uh, according to participants, uh, a feasible solution to this puzzle of uh, legislation approaches uh, could be the harmonization at European Union level. Uh, the inequalities in national and cross-national level uh, would be diminished. But uh, the process of uh, harmonization uh, is uh, tedious because um, it's a process that uh, needs uh, detailed uh, work uh, and it has to overcome uh, differences in national uh, uh, legislation. Uh, Spain is such a case uh, where Spanish law is uh, latently aligned with European Union policy. Uh, moreover, a uh, legislation framework for science and uh, research uh, could uh, contribute uh, constructively. Um, this slide presents uh, an attempt that we made to automatically uh, categorize uh, the data that we collected from uh, interviews. We implemented a machine learning technique called uh, topic modeling uh, in order to detect the relationship between the latent topics in uh, the transcribed uh, text. Uh, the LDA algorithm which was applied, gave us the opportunity to detect five main topics. Policy, stakeholders, implementation, legislation, and access. May I just interrupt you? You've got five minutes. Yes. Thank yes, you thank much. you very much. I'm aware of, uh, of it. Uh, the width of uh, the arcs presents the coherence between the topics. So, we can notice here that access is uh, strongly connected uh, with policies, uh, legislation and implementation. Another notable aspect of uh, this network is um, the loose connection between policies and uh, legislation. Uh, implementation, as you can see, stands uh, between them, um, but uh, not strongly connected. And uh, that points out the, the difficulties in the implementation. Um, certainly, our study is not lacking of uh, concerns. Uh, the growth of open access requires a lot of effort from uh, all the actors involved. Lobbying is always a countervailing force against the viable solution of SPR. On the one hand, uh, there are the copyright and economic issues, and on the other hand, we are always trying to find the balance between rights holder and ethical aspects. Before summarizing my presentation, I will address some uh, rhetoric questions. In the end, where does the issue of SPR uh, fit in? Is it an economic, uh, scientific, copyright, or open access issue? In reality, SPR from its base is blurred, as I mentioned at uh, the beginning of my presentation. Uh, for this exact reason, it is, treat, uh, it is treated uh, differently in each country. We, uh, we believe that SPR is both a copyright and open access topic. Uh, key stakeholders need uh, to take initiatives to increase political support. Otherwise, the efforts will remain inactive. Uh, the multidimensional nature of the issue also requires a multidimensional knowledge and, of course, coordinated cooperation. This fact will improve the communication in the dialogue between the different bodies. Um, 
At the same time, an implementation effort should include a set of resources, such as uh, uh, skilled people, funds, and infrastructure, and uh, advisory groups that will act as a, a point of reference at national level. Uh, I, have, I have chosen to close my presentation with a line from a participant, which uh, summarizes a lot of uh, the aforementioned. It's better to have a poor law and a good implementation than a good law and no implementation. By poor, it's not meant, it's not meant um, bad, but uh, poorly defined, uh, while uh, weight is given to the implementation part. Uh, we are discussing the legislative uh, texts and the intentions and the objectives uh, of uh, the involved stakeholders. And as a result, uh, we lose the basic notion of the whole issue, which is um, access to knowledge. Thank you very much. I think I am on time. Uh, I'm uh, stopping sharing my screen and I'm giving the floor to John. Kiriaki, thank you ever so much for a really fascinating presentation. We're going to take questions after John's presentation. So just hold on, uh, put your questions in the chat if you haven't already done so. We're sourcing those and organizing those. But um, next up, yes, it's uh, John Treadway, Director of Great Northwood Consulting, um, working for Spark Europe on Project Retain. Over to you, John, thank you. Hi, Vanessa, hopefully you can hear me and oh, see my screen. Um, so I, uh, it's very, it's a pleasure to join you. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the other side of this, these two projects. Um, so Project Retain is a, one of the strands focused on copyright related to research practices and non-legislative legislative approaches. And we've looked at four particular areas. So copyright research publications, author rights retention, open licensing, and the reuse of research publications. Um, and we have, we have sought to understand how different stakeholder groups, by which I mean funders, publishers, and in particular institutions, are supporting researchers and how their policies affect them. Um, I have worked on this project alongside the steering group, um, which members, uh, I think Eva and Ignacy, as well as Vanessa, have joined us today, and they will they're all much more deeply knowledgeable of these topics than I am, and I look forward to their support when we have the panel discussion. But um, I'm going to present um, an overview of some of the work that we've done. Uh, our project has been running slightly longer than Project Zero. We began work in earnest, I think, in September or October last year through to earlier this year. So I'm going to give you an overview of that work done um, and then dive in detail into some of the areas. So the support uh, in place for researchers and what policies we have found in place within institutions. Um, then we're going to focus in particular on author rights retention policies and then um, have a look at how publishers have responded to those policies and what um, policies they themselves have got in place and what, what has changed, if anything, about publisher policies around rights retention and copyright. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit uh, in detail about open licensing at the end of this uh, session before um, some final thoughts and next steps. Um, I think some of you, a few of you may have attended an event last week on uh, in the UK on open access and um, artificial intelligence. Um, so forgive me, some of what I'm going to say today duplicates what I said at that event last week, but um, I was unable to attend that in person, so I'll be able to respond to questions here in more detail. And uh, I'm going to present a bit more of a detailed look in each of these areas on the role of the library and um, some of the wider policy developments and implications outside of the UK, uh, which was the focus last week. So I just wanted to mention those aspects. And as Vanessa said, please do put questions in the chat um, and we'll be happy to dive into those after this session. So um, the work we've done, um, much of it is similar in approach to what we heard from Project Zero earlier, but we have undertaken a survey of around just short, short of 150 different European institutions in the areas 
uh, that we were focused on. We followed that up with a wide range of qualitative research. So we have spoken then to 28 different institutions who responded to our survey via focus groups and one-to-one -one interviews. Uh, we've spoken to uh, six funders and to uh, Coalition S, um, a group of funders for their perspectives and to understand the development of their policies. We've spoken to five different publishers um, and to three umbrella organizations representing publishers. And then we conducted a workshop with, in partnership with Eurodoc, uh, where we sought the input of some of their, some of their researchers uh, affiliated with our organization. We coupled that with a desk-based analysis of institutional rights retention policy. So a really deep dive into the policies developed in that area, as well as um, a desk-based review of 11 large copyright, uh, large publishers copyright and licensing policies and a detailed analysis of over 9,400 um, journals listed in the DOAJ from Europe. Those last two points um, follow a report that uh, uh, that um, Spark Europe, forgive me, published in 2020. So we've been following up to see what's an analysis of those areas, but also seeing what's changed since 2020. So that's the work we've done. It's taken us a while. Um, as Vanessa said earlier, you know, copyright. When, when Vanessa talked to me about this project, I wasn't sure that copyright would be a particularly interesting area to work on for nine months, but it has been uh, revealing and insightful. And uh, hopefully, we can share some of the insights that we've generated today with you. Well, we will share some of the insights. I hope they'll be interesting. Um, so, the profile of respondents first. So, let me talk about the survey results. We had nearly 150 responses. Um, those were split across Europe, as you can see on the left on that map. Uh, the largest number were from the UK. We had a large number of respondents as well from Portugal, Sweden, France and Poland. And then, as with many of these surveys, a, a long tail of respondents, one or two or three or four or five from a number of other European countries. We were very pleased with that coverage. But um, the, the, the depth of responses from the UK, something I'll get to in a few moments. The majority of respondents, the significant majority of respondents were representatives of libraries, 84%, uh, with another 5%, that orange bar represents the research office, so people working in research offices. Um, and it's not shown here, but something like 60%, just over 60% of the respondents were uh, from research intensive universities, with another 10% or so from non-research intensive universities and technical universities. Um, and in particular, Sweden and the UK, those research intensive universities drove the responses from those, those two countries in particular. Um, one of the areas that we asked those institutions about was which areas they were already providing support for, which areas that we were focused on did they provide to support to researchers in? And, and, and this chart breaks down that response. Um, the vast majority of institutions that responded to us provide support around copyright of scientific publications, around open licensing, around the reuse of research publications, and 75% nearly provide support around author rights retention. But um, those are interesting figures because, um, as I'll get onto in a minute, not all of the institutions providing support have policies in those areas. And it meant that a high number of those responding to us were already actively involved in providing support to researchers in the areas that we were focusing on. Um, we then asked in what areas are researchers seeking support? So it's one thing to ask people whether they're providing support in a particular area, but it's another thing to ask them whether or not that research uh, researchers are actively seeking support in those areas. And here, it's like flipping the numbers. So Yes, there were lots. Um, there are, you know, somewhere approaching 40 percent of institutions said researchers are frequently or very frequently seeking support on copyright of scientific publications. But a, a, a much larger number are seeking support on open licensing and a similar number are seeking support on reuse of scientific publications. So open licensing is a very strong area in which researchers are seeking support from the institutions that uh, we were getting responses from. And then the other point that I'll draw response to is so lots of institutions already providing support around author rights retention, but that's the area in which fewest researchers or, or researchers are least commonly, least often seeking support at the time we 
undertook our survey. Um, the majority of our respondents came from libraries, but it's still striking that when we asked within your institution who is responsible for providing that support, the library is clearly in each of the areas that we were asking about the department that is most consistently responsible for providing support. There is some, you know, you can see there that the legal office is uh, has a role in providing support for um, copyright of research publications and rights retention. I think that's something we've come to understand is important. Uh, but apart from that, everything, all of the other numbers are less than 25%, mostly less than 20%. So the library is the area driving most of the support. Now, and as I said, the significant majority of our respondents were from libraries, but I would say that we framed the question um, such that we were asking people about the whole of their institution and, and the level of knowledge they had was, was strong from, from other questions that we asked. And also from the in-depth interviews that we've conducted, we think this is quite representative. We think that the support provision um, in these areas is is embedded in the library, but um, we'll explore, I think the role of the legal office in policy development is particularly important around author rights retention. It's an area I'll return to in one minute. Um, so focusing on those four areas, we also asked institutions how many, whether they had policies in place covering copyright the scientific publications, open licensing, and the reuse of scientific publications and author rights retention. And the particular point I want to draw attention to here is that while the fewest number of institutions have policies in place around author rights retention, there are 32 who at the time of our survey were actively developing a policy in that area. Um, that's a very striking number. Um, and is, this is an area of rapid development. I think if I go to the next slide, oh, I'll come, come back to that side, apologies. Those are not in the order I was expecting. So this breaks down those institutions who are have a rights retention policy in place or are currently developing one. And the number of institutions actively developing rights retention policies in the United Kingdom you know, there, are, there are significant in other areas. So that the number of um, institutions actively thinking about uh, this area is really striking. The policies in place have been developed over the last two years, largely. And so this is an area of rapid activity. And we know from, we had one uh, remarkable incident where we were interviewing an institution as part of this project, who had a policy in development. And literally during the conversation we had with them, that policy was approved by their relevant decision-making policy. And so flipped to being one that was actually uh, in place and uh, had been formally approved. So there's a real rapid development in this area. Um, through the responses we've received and the work that we've done, we, we come to develop a, um, a working definition for an author rights retention policy which I've put on the screen here. So it's an expressed position, a stated position, setting out the practice of retaining sufficient rights for academic works produced by an institution of researchers to make the work openly accessible and reusable immediately. I think this was something that became important. Obviously, it became, it became obvious to us that this was important as we dug into the policies that institutions were saying they had in place that covered author rights retention there's a wide variety um, and, and we became aware that some of the policies people were categorizing that way were not things that we would categorize in that way. So the examples I would give were simple self-archiving policies that required authors to archive uh, their published works in the institution's repository. That wouldn't fall under this definition because it doesn't say anything about the retention of actual rights by the author. But a couple of times we became aware of policies that had been categorized that way, but were just self-archiving policies. Another one would be um, for an institution with a university press, the licensing policies that that university press applied to publications um, and, and allowed authors to retain. Again, that's a different thing to what we were looking at. So I think, again, it shows the rapid development in this area different levels of awareness and engagement. And, and we this was not the definition that we had in mind at the beginning of the project, but it's something that has evolved as we've gone along. Um, 
So I said, well, there's a lot of variation in rights retention policies. Let me let me talk about that in some more detail. Um, the features of rights retention policies that we've identified vary along a number of dimensions, and this um, table sets out some of those. Um, the policy itself can be either a mandate requiring authors to do certain things or mandating that certain rights retained by an author, or they can be um, recommendations or guidance. So um, policies that set out best practice or recommend to authors that they follow certain processes to ensure they meet funder requirements. We see examples of both of those. Um, the policy can be an open access policy or a copyright policy. In many cases, it's one related to intellectual property or publications or scholarly output. There's quite a lot of variation here. In most cases, it's open access or copyright. But I would say that it's, it's very clear that the context in individual institutions is very different. And so as they think about a rights retention policy, it often becomes uh, important for them to revise their whole policy stack to, so that it fits together well. Um, it varies by the content covered. So is it just journal articles or all scholarly output? By the authors covered, is it faculty or non-faculty or uh, researchers, uh, um, uh, students? Uh, it varies as to whether a policy is opt-in or opt out. And that can change. We've seen that change uh, when the policy goes from being a pilot or an interim one to being fully approved. Um, the legal basis for the policy is incredibly important. Um, the acts, the, the, um, there are the, one of the reasons why the UK has seen such proliferation is a clarity of the legal status in the UK. The work done by the United Kingdom Scholarly Communications Licence Group over a number of years clarified the basis on which it could be done in the UK. And that approach doesn't necessarily work for institutions in other countries. And that depth of legal work that has been done by the UK SDL and carried out by uh, institutions, carried on by institutions like Edinburgh is a really foundational element in why we've seen so many policies of that kind in the UK. And, and the basis for the uh, legal uh, for the policy. The legal basis for the policy is a critical element. And then also the version of article to which it refers, the um, specified processes involved, including the application of particular licenses or the deposit into an institutional policy. These are also different elements that we see in the UK. I think it's important also here to mention these dimensions follow very closely those highlighted by the uh, University of Harvard. Um, and the uh, record maintained by Peter Suber there of institutions developing open access policies with rights retention in place. Harvard's had a policy of this kind for many years. And, and the, the dimensions of variation that we find in Europe closely mirror some of those that they highlight in Harvard. Um, so I just mentioned the legal position. Let me talk a little bit about some of the other factors driving development. So where institutions are developing rights retention policies, access to legal advice and the nature of the legal context in which the institutions operate is critical. Their comfort in introducing a policy, um, being able to satisfy the institution that the risk it's taking on is low and that it can be handled, that there is a legal basis is very important. And again, I refer to the importance of the work done by the UK SCL and the UK uh, a, a few years ago, and, and that's been carried on by other institutions. The culture of open access is very important. So we've seen rapid development of these policies in countries where there's um, where there are transformative agreements, where there's a culture of commercial APCs. So many of the institutions involved in developing it are seeking to find routes for authors to publish open access that are less expensive or more equitable. Um, and, and that's, you know, we've seen that in the UK, but also in some of the Scandinavian countries where we've seen pockets of institutional policies being developed. Funder influence is very important. Um, so Coalition S's uh, rights retention policy has shifted the um, window and so created a desire and a, a sense that there is an opportunity here for institutions. It's caused them to investigate options. They are also responding to funder policies as Authors require support to fulfill their funder obligations and institutions are well placed to provide that support. The need for networks. So um, the UK SCL brought together a number of institutions who discussed this and where it's been moved forward 
it has been moved forward by those operating in networks. I think Edinburgh and, and um, Tromsø, the University of the Arctic in Norway have been early adopters, but there's a network of Scottish institutions who pursued this. There are conversations between research intensive organization, uh, institutions in Norway. The N8 group in the UK have also been active. So pockets and networks and also peer pressure, people wanting to respond to what they're Peer institutions are doing is very important. And uh, apologies, I've actually got response to funder uh, twice in that set of bullets at the same point. Um, some other significant points I'd make about this. I I've mentioned already the rapid pace of development. Um, I'm responding, I'm referring to our research. We know that this is changing rapidly and that some of the institutions that were in one stage when we spoke to them have moved forwards. Um, I think half the UK institutions, uh, somebody quoted that half the institutions in the UK may now be looking at developing policies. Um, highlight, this is something that comes out of interviews. This is not, um, development of a policy by an institution is not simple. It takes time for the people in the institution to understand what's happening. Um, one institution said it took a whole year for them to research and understand it, develop the policy and get agreement on it. Um, and it takes resource to support it, to um, write letters to publishers, which is a particular element that's required under UK law for such policies to be uh, viable. Um, it is not something that's done simply, although I would say that with the number of policies that are in development and the groups supporting each other, I think the barriers to entry have lowered. So it is now easier for institutions to dedicate resource and less resources required, but it's not inconsiderable. Um, I referred earlier to the implications for the policy stack in institutions. Often they have to revise their copyright and open access policies as a result. And um, it's not a replacement for publishing open access via other routes. It's better seen by all of those who are implementing it as a complement to publishing open access through other routes um, and as a response in some ways to, to those different open access routes. Um, and I refer there, oh, sorry, I've got two other points here. Libraries are really important. I showed that earlier in terms of support, but also in terms of policy development, but really important to get leadership across the institution from other areas, not just senior academics, but also legal and financial elements. And the ownership, I think, Everyone who successfully developed the policy referred to the fact it's not seen as a library policy. It's developed and um, launched with the support of academics and it's widely seen as being owned by them. So it's it's about academics having something, gaining something, not just doing something because the library is telling them to. And then the variation in alignment between funders and institutions. So institutional policy development is very much a response to funder activity, but the level of engagement in countries between funders and institution varies. In the UK, I think the uh, UKRI is supportive or, or neutral on institutional policy development and hasn't been actively involved. I think in France, where there are initiatives looking at the viability of rights retention, the relationship between research institutions and funders on this issue is really close and they're doing it in lockstep. So, there's, there's some variation in the alignment and proximity between funders and institutions on this topic. There's no specific reason why a funder policy and an institutional policy have to be tied together, although as a mutual support mechanism, it obviously has advantages. Um, I've got a couple of things, further things I want to talk about. Um, the publisher position on a rights retention. So, um, we talked to a number of publishers and to umbrella bodies representing publishers. Uh, we talked to lots of institutions and to funders who have engaged with publishers as part of policy development. And I, I think the response from publishers to date is best, respond, best seen as limited. Uh, we might describe it as a wait and see approach, particularly in relation to uh, institutional policies, policies in the UK where they have written to publishers and notified them of the, their um, rights retention policy that is essentially says the institution has a prior license before any license to publish is established. Most publishers have not responded. There have not been responses to those. Uh, and institutions that have received responses have received as many positive as they have received negative responses to their new policy. And that itself is, a, is an example of the inconsistency across the market from different publishers and indeed within individual publishers. I think I probably have about five minutes left, so I will wrap up. I have about three slides, so uh, I think we're 
all good. Um, I think uh, in the chat, I think, I don't know if it was Sally Rossi, apologies if it was not. Sally's put um, a link to a blog about bringing nature policy. Again, this is, this is another area of rapid development. I think publishers are working out what their response is in many cases, but there are many examples of publishers who support rights retention, who are attempting to make open access work in different ways. So they don't quite know what to do with rights retention language. And so they're finding alternatives. And I think another point to make here is, you know, Harvard and many other US institutions have had policies with rights retention in place for over a decade without any significant disruption or change. So um, in many ways, the institutional policy development is familiar to publishers, even if it's happening in um, countries where they're not used to it. Um, the concerns where they're expressed are predicated on the use of a CC BY license for articles made available under rights retention, and that when the uh, author accepted manuscript is used, that risks undermining the version of record and um, a significant element of why people want to go through a publisher to maintain the scholarly record. Um, I would also say that there's a concern around the unforeseen consequences of authorized retention. Um, many publishers are going to rapidly expand their APC uh, publishing programs as a result of, um, if, if, if rights retention takes off, we can expect to see publishers aggressively pursuing um, APC routes. And, and that may have implications for some publishers who cannot sustain publishing through APC routes. Um, I think unforeseen consequences, this remains to be seen. It's not an area in which we have much evidence at present, but it's, it's, it's a commonly expressed concern. Um, publisher policies positions since 2020 have not changed substantially in relation to copyright or author rights retention. Embargo lengths, there's been change in embargo lengths, but it's been inconsistent and they haven't substantially reduced or changed. More and more publishers, particularly large commercial publishers, do allow a CC license to be applied to self archive material, but it's not usually CC BY. And looking in the DOAJ, I think only 7% have changed. DOAJ uh, in 2020 only articulated the most uh, restrictive license, and now it does include all licenses, but only 7% of journals have changed the most restrictive license they offer. And of those, two thirds have changed to a more permissive license. So you've got 7% have changed the license and two thirds of that 7% have moved more permissively rather than uh, more restrictively. There's a lot going on in there because of the DOA change, J change, but it does fit into the overall headline that publisher policy positions in this area as we track them have not changed substantially. And this chart is the licenses offered, but it's the most restrictive license offered by, um, it's actually 15 of the largest, the 15 largest publishers in DOAJ of European journals. So they publish the most journals. And I, I highlight this for two points. One is it's inconsistent. Many are off, many have journals that offer. So if you look at or, uh, Wiley, for example, 29% of Wiley's journals offer CC BY as the most restrictive, 69% offer CC BY and CND. Um, CNDO uh, is a slightly complex one, but there's a lot of inconsistency in the licenses offered. That said, there's a distinction between those who offer only open access journals and those who continue to publish hybrid. So those uh, publishers who are focused on 100% open access um, all use CC BY almost across the board, whereas those publishing hybrid and open access journals offer a complex variety of licenses. So, um, and I return here because I think it's interesting on open licensing too. This is um, back to the institutional survey we conducted. Um, many institutions are recommending the use of open licenses, but many are not offering just recommending CC BY, many are recommending other license types or are not mentioning license types at all and are simply asking people to use the most open license they feel able to. It's it's a complicated area, open licensing. And I think across the board, whether it's publishers or institutions and funders, um, it's not clear that we have uniform support for CC BY. So some final thoughts very quickly. There's a lot of potential for rights retention policies and rapid development, but progress is and will be uneven. They're heavily dependent on context, particularly the legal context, and they require resources and time. Um, the more that we can talk in non-monolithic perspectives of policies, because policies are very different, 
of researchers because researchers are in very different positions of institutions because the resources required mean it's easier for some institutions than others and publishers because some publishers are supported and actively able to support rights retention the more we can talk about things according to nuance the better and again i re-emphasize that need for continued advocacy on open licensing and the particular value of cc by because we've seen a lot of areas where cc by is not being actively promoted the next steps for us are to finish analysis and publish our report and recommendations and develop calls to action and uh, campaign in this area so uh, how to highlight the value to people um, promote the value of dialogue and continue to present our findings in for like this. Uh, I think I've gone on slightly long, so apologies for that. But um, thank you, and um, we look forward to hearing more from you now and, and, and carrying on the debate. Thank you very Vanessa. much, John. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to invite Kiriaki back also to share your screen, just to answer a couple of questions that we have in the chat before we open up the panel. Um, so for Kiriaki, oh, yes, there we are. We have you. Um, there was a question here, um, important question. How did you measure success? You were talking about measuring the success of um, secondary publishing rights policy or legislation. Uh, did you explore that a bit more in your interviews or, or somehow else? Um, actually, we cannot uh, measure uh, success with uh, strict and uh, uh, measurable uh, cr criteria. Uh, we are uh, based on the participants' uh, perceptions and uh, we reflect uh, their perception um, here. Um, there is, though, the indication of uh, the percentage of um, the version of records. And uh, uh, we, we, we shouldn't forget that uh, uh, green open access uh, has uh, special uh, character characteristics and uh, the field by its, itself is uh, dynamic. Thank you very much. Got a couple of questions for John. Um, John, um, did you get any information of any legal action due to rights retention? So mm. I think we didn't ask that in the survey, but through your interviews. Uh, no, um, no. Uh, so I would say, I mean, this the closest to this is the the. So I think this is rapid developing, rapidly developing area. And there's so much change and uncertainty that I would have been surprised if we'd heard about anything and we didn't hear about anything. What we mostly heard was that there has not been much in the way of response. And I think it's also fair to say that, you know, US institutions who've had policies of this type in place for a number of years would also report that they have never seen legal action against them or uh, the individual researchers involved. So uh, I'm not aware of anything in this area. Vanessa, you may have heard of something or, or others may have, but no, it, it was something that didn't come up and, and where we didn't ask about it. I, I think it would have come up had there been something for any of the institutions or individuals that we spoke to. I think in Germany there was something, but okay. let's move on swiftly to the next question. Um, another interesting one um, regarding the publisher license policy side. Did you look at the ownership of the license and mandatory transfer of CC by NC or N NC ND licenses to the publisher? Yeah. I'm wondering whether Ignasi, has Ignasi arrived? Ignasi did come in at some point. I don't know. I haven't seen whether he's still Could here. Can I maybe but... pass, pass on to Ignasi? Um, because... Yeah, Vanessa. Hello, yes. everyone. Hi, Ignasi. Are you able to answer that question? Uh, sorry, I'm just assuming, John, that you <laughs> might not answer that one. I mean, I could answer it, but I'll do it badly compared to Ignasi. Please go ahead, John. <laughs> no, please go ahead, Ignasi. So can you repeat, please, Vanessa, the question? Again? Yes, of course. So regarding publisher license policy, uh, did you look at the ownership of license and mandatory transfer of CC by NC or NC and D licenses to the publisher? Yes. Have, yeah, go ahead. Yes, in fact, in fact, we, we did that because we uh, realized that in some publishers, 
when they provide these options, they also state that when uh, authors choose these options, they gave uh, an exclusive license for the commercial or derivative uses to the uh, publisher. So it is stated that the author only keep the same rights than the reader. So that's something that we, we check in this uh, review of the publishers. Thank you very much. Um, also one of the Project Retain team, thank you for coming in. We've also got Janice from the Zero team uh, with his camera on. So we will be involved in the next uh, panel, but we've got one last question here, another one, another interesting one. Uh, on your final point, John, about does, av does avoiding monolithic approaches to rights retention policies play into right the rights holder desire to maintain a fragmented policy picture? Interesting. <laughs> That's an interesting question. So, I mean, uh, so probably by definition, no, it doesn't, because not all publishers have, so not all publishers have an issue with rights retention. Number of written back to institutions to welcome their approach. So by definition, they're not a monolithic group. Some rights holders uh, do desire what you're describing, I think, Chris, but not all. But I would also highlight by that point, I'm trying to, um, I'm returning to the point that the legal context in different countries is very different. And therefore the pace at which uh, institutions can develop rights retention policies in different countries is, is different, as you know far better than me actually, Chris. Um, and also that individual institutions who are putting in place rights retention policies are finding that they can't just take a, um, I oh, can't just take a template and apply it because their existing policy stack needs to be adjusted for it. And so the nature of the rights retention, the work they have to do in the rights retention policy that they end up with will be different in different cases. So it's heavily contextual. Um, and I think the more people are aware of that, the better, particularly as there's quite a lot of um, the dialogue is quite polarized on this topic. And I think being aware of the range of different uh, perspectives is, is just valuable for us. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Um, so just to bring a couple more voices in uh, to the panel, uh, I'm just inviting the uh, retain team or two of them uh, and zero team to have a think about, well, what you heard from each other. Is there something that uh, got you curious, you found interesting or found was very similar to what you had discovered. So Project Zero, what was interesting about what you heard from John or um, Project Retain, what inspired you about what you heard from Kiriaki? Maybe you have a question or is there something of particular interest you'd like to share? Hello, if, if, if I may. First of all, thank you again uh, for the invitation and you know the attendance of many good colleagues. Uh, well, uh, of course, I've seen the presentation of John in a, a week ago in, in London. So <laughs> now he, he, I'm a little bit aware of you know of the content and the findings of the project retain. But what is interested interesting is that uh, the finding that uh, um, there is a lot of need for support on copyright issues and about you know uh, reuse issues of scholarly content. I mean, this is you know very, very critical because um, we all need this safe and 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 stable environment where we can reuse content, not just access it. I mean, we we need to have you know those safe conditions. And we have experienced, especially in COVID, uh, the difficulty in reusing content in academia uh, as well as in teaching and of course in uh, for, for research purposes. So I think that was, uh, this was very um, uh, important. This is very, very critical that uh, support services around uh, the reusability of content are uh, so much needed. Thank you, Janice. Project Retain, something that you took away from hearing of, uh, about Project Zero? 
something you'd like uh, to add? I'm happy to take that. I don't know if that's directed specifically at me, Vanessa, but I'm happy to take it because I unfortunately couldn't see Yanis's presentation last week. So I was really pleased to see the Project Zero presentation today. The thing, and I didn't know, I don't know anywhere near as much about um, SPR as I would like to, but the thing that I took away was how it, and I was talking about large retention being contextual and um, varying in nature and not being monolithic, et cetera. But uh, it's struck, it striking that SPR is not one thing, that it's economic and legal and depends on the political economy and different, you know, different ministries involved and different type of legal development. Um, but, you know, the need for coordination and engagement and local variation, strikingly similar in a different way to, to, to the things that we found in um, in our work on rights retention and, and copyright. So really interesting to hear that. That's the thing that struck out for me. Thank you. Um, so I think I'd like to ask uh, the panel, what are the kinds of fertile conditions necessary to develop either kind of policy? I know you touched on some of these things, but uh, if in the audience um, anyone is particularly interested in one of these models, what are the things that they need to consider or what are the, the must-haves, those conditions to um, develop and successfully implement such a policy? Maybe Ignati? Yeah, well, I, I was thinking, for instance, on the right to retention, I think it's important if, if we, as an institution, want to develop a, a policy, it's important to clarify uh, at the beginning, which is the, the copyright uh, regime that applies within your institution and in within your country, because we've seen different approaches and the same, I guess, uh, what I see from the secondary publishing rights. So it's important to have that to, to support uh, as an institutional, your researchers on uh, publishing towards the, the publishers and the conditions of the publishers. And, and to raise a lot of awareness among your community. So that's, I think, uh, if we want to uh, uh, implement a right retention within your institution, uh, you need to, to be aware of all these issues beforehand, because if not, I think uh, it would be a, a pos possible failure. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to respond to that? Um, yes, I mean, there are a couple of things, like um, Ignacy said, okay, you know, there is a context in, in every country about, of course, we have the harmonization at the European level, but okay, but we have different copyright cultures, we have uh, different cultures about um, who is the rights holder in uh, scientific publications in its country, so this is very, very common and affecting both, you know, the uh, SPR as well as rights retention. And of course, you know, there are many, many differences as you saw in Kiryaki's uh, presentation. There are, I will say, different schools regarding SPR. But what is uh, most important, and we come to, um, to, to another level of, you know, another side is that, okay, even if you have this SPR in your country, uh, the SPR itself says nothing if you don't have a, a coordinated, well-structured, well-operating uh, implementation. Uh, and this requires energy, this requires resources. Uh, having something on the paper is not that uh, will make things uh, work. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we are experiencing this in national open, open access policies. And we see, you know, the hurdles and the difficulties. So imagine if you want to go a, a, a step further, it needs extra coordination. It needs, you know, extra, uh, you know, effort. So I think uh, this will be taken into consideration because we have seen uh, and we have gathered, you know, from uh, the participants in our study that uh, the law was there, but, you know, there was not the commitment of the states to support, you know, the implementation of the law. So this is very uh, vital. Thank you very much. And that's where the institutions come in, right, to support their authors as well. 
Um, thank you. Um, I think we've just got room for one more question. It's gone by so quickly. Um, how are policymakers in engaging with those who will be impacted by the policy? If we, if we think about the researchers, I know, I know you both touched on that, but could you say a little bit more about um, how policymakers engage with researchers, with research managers, um, with the leadership of the institutions, uh, or on a national level, um, engaging the communities who will be impacted? Or is that not really happening? Uh, well, uh, I mean, this is something uh, always challenging uh, to to get the community, let's call it this way, into the process of policymaking. Uh, uh, we have recently some uh, experience here when we have a new law of science or uh, a new law of universities where, ha where we have included uh, some uh, issues related to with the right retentions and secondary publishing rights. And, and I think uh, there has been some involvement of the, let's call the research community into the drafting of the changes, because in fact, for instance, the Spanish law of science is a, an update of, a, of a, a law that we had in the past from 2011. So I, I know and, and I, I must acknowledge that some people was, uh, let's say, advising or giving some wording on, on, the, on the changes of the law. So in this case, that it's a recent, a recent case from last year, uh, the policymaker has heard the voices of the researchers. Uh, and of course, it's always difficult to hear the researchers because there are many disciplines, there is many people, but at least some organizations that could be representing the researchers and the institutions have uh, had the chance to say something. So I, I must say that I congratulate uh, all, all of us to, to make this possible in this case. But of course, in other case, it has been otherwise and it has been really hard to, to hear the, the researchers. For, for instance, uh, if we look at some of the developing uh, processes of making changes in copyright law, uh, sometimes there researchers haven't seen, uh, haven't been heard by the policymaker. So there are cases where, yes, we can raise our voice and we can collaborate on making these uh, developments. And in other cases where other stakeholders are more heard than the research community. Thank you. Anybody else would like to add something? Um, I would like to echo what Ignacy said. Then, of course, I mean, we are looking at Spain, you know, with great interest because it's one of the cases that uh, now we have legislation that the requires open access. And we know, you know, from the interviews with the Spanish colleagues that uh, the Spanish government. <laughs> excuse me, uh, gave, you know, uh, space to uh, the researchers and the research, uh, the researcher side, you know, uh, councils and so on, uh, to, to develop, to co-develop the law. It's quite often the case that we have seen SPR legislation developed directly, you know, from the ministries without taking into account the voice of the researchers, of the universities. Uh, and perhaps this has happened in what we have, we would like to call like the first generation of SPRs. Now we are moving to the second generation of SPRs where we understand better the problem. We understand, uh, you know, better the mission of open access, what is uh, and the green open access and uh, repositories and the role there in uh, the global sustainable a scholarly communication system. Uh, so I think that if policy makers and politicians and governments and ministries would like to have an effective uh, SPR in their country, uh, giving the, 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 the space for and, and the room for them to co-shape, to co-design, uh, you know, the legislation will be uh, the minimum, the threshold for, uh, for success. Thank you so much uh, for those last words. Um, I think that's going to wrap us up for today. Um,
just like to say that there's a lot more to come. Um, we are both um, going to publish our reports. There will also be plans of action. Um, so it just doesn't uh, sit with research and a report and that's it, but we really want to see how can we mobilize the community? How can we work together to move this forward? Uh, I think some of these lessons learned and experiences are really just so valuable. Um, and we really need to share this with those who need to know and those who uh, can really um, make change in, uh, in, a, in a policy that really supports open access. So uh, I'd like to just encourage you to look at the Knowledge Rights 21 uh, website to look for the recording of this if you want to share it with anyone else, if you found it interesting, uh, and also to look out uh, there um, uh, or at, uh, at, at the Spark Europe or Libre pages for our reports, which will be out in, uh, in the next months. So keep your eyes peeled. We will be having more events as well. Um, we've just got to still think about what are we going to be doing uh, next? There will be lots more to come. So looking forward to seeing you again, I hope. And thank you very much for uh, spending time with us this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are. And thank you very much to the speakers, of course, today and to Libba for uh, organizing and being in the background. Um, thank you all. Have a nice evening.